Namaste and hello to all the learners. This is part of the series of video program Wetlands the Amrit Dharohar. By now we know what wetlands are, their types and how they are beneficial to us. In this session we will get to know how wetlands function and what are the biophysical characteristics of wetlands. Wetlands are transitional zones known as ecotones between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. They make up a very large number of landforms that are inundated or saturated by water partly or throughout the year and support specialized vegetation adapted to such conditions. The Ramsar Convention and Intergovernmental Treaty on wetlands define wetlands as areas of marsh, fen, peatland or water, whether natural or artificial, permanent or temporary, with water that is static or flowing, fresh, brackish or salty, including areas of marine water, the depth of which at low tides does not exceed 6 meters. After defining the wetlands, let us now learn about how wetlands function. Wetlands are critical to the water cycle in the inlands. They trap rainwater and run off and slowly release it to the other surface water areas, groundwaters and the atmosphere. Wetlands contain various life forms, species such as fungi, snails and microorganisms like azotobacter and nitrobacter decompose the complex forms of nutrients into simpler ones. These simpler forms are then used for sustenance by a diversity of life. Thus, wetlands play an important role in nutrient and water cycling. As water enters a wetland, it spreads out and flows through dense wetland vegetation. These plants are called hydrophytes and they reduce the water's velocity allowing suspended material to settle down in the wetland floor. From here, the roots of wetland plants take over and bind the accumulated sediments. All of these factors work together such that the resulting outflowing water has substantially reduced amounts of silt. By doing this, wetlands also help in the purification of water. Let us now try to understand what types of plants grow in wetlands. It is interesting to note that the conditions prevailing in these ecotones or transitional zones also become conducive for different types of vegetation to survive and thrive. These specialized plants known as hydrophytes are adapted to grow in water or moist soil and can also withstand long floods and droughts. Hydrophytes are further differentiated into different groups. The first group is emergent plants. These have their significant portion of the body outside water and grow near the edges of the wetland. These vascular plants often have deep and dense roots that stabilize shallow soils. Examples, reeds and sedges. The second group is submerged plants. These are also rooted to the bottom but their leaves grow entirely underwater. Examples of such plants are hornwort and water thyme. The third group is floating plants. These plants have leaves that float on the water surface. Their roots may be attached in the substrate or floating in the water column. Examples of such plants are lotus 
and water chestnut. The fourth category is free floating plants. These plants float freely on the water surface. The entire plant is suspended on the water, allowing the plant to be moved around the pond by wind and water currents. Examples of such plants are duckweed and water hyacinth. These were the four categories of plants found in wetlands. It is a matter of fact that a rich vegetation and corresponding substrate will cater to the equally diverse and fascinating faunal life. After knowing about the flora or the plants found in wetlands, let us broadly look at what exactly constitutes the animal life in wetlands. The first type of animals found in the wetlands are zooplanktons. These are planktonic organisms that are unable to swim effectively against the water current. Some of the examples are Daphnia and Cyclops. Another type of animals found in wetlands are Neuston. These are also called Pleuston. They can live on top of the water surface or may be attached to the underside of the water surface. Examples are water striders and dragonflies. The third category is Nectan. This is an assemblage of pelagic animals that swim freely independent of water current or wind. Examples of such animals are fishes and turtles. Apart from the categories of animals discussed, wetlands also have birds. Birds are primarily dependent on wetlands for breeding, feeding and resting. Many migratory birds are wetland dependent or obligate species. Examples of such birds are bar-headed goose and saras green. So learners, wetlands have various types of plants, animals and birds living in and around them. The web of life we have just learnt about is an integral part of the larger web of life constituting all lives on the earth. Let us now look at wetlands through a broader lens. When we broaden our horizon to a larger perspective of life, we can see that the theory of evolution itself is embodied by the dance of life. There is a movement from water to waterland and finally to land. Wetlands therefore symbolize growth, adaptations and the very perpetuity of its motion. So, in this session, we understood that wetlands are not a single unit, but they are a part of the larger ecosystem of the earth. It has its own plant and animal life and has an ecosystem of itself. In this manner, wetlands form an important entity of the larger web of life existing on the earth. Therefore, it is important to conserve the wetlands. We will discuss the threats that our wetlands face and the ways to conserve the wetlands in the next session. Till then, you can observe the wetlands near your surrounding and make a list of plants, animals, birds and insects living in and around it. Try to relate the existence of all the organisms as an entity of the larger ecosystem of your locality.